All right, this is Unit 7 Ecology, and we are going to start with Concept 1. We're just going to do an introduction to ecology as a whole because it's a really, really large branch of biology. So first, what is ecology? It is the study of relationships, and we're looking at relationships between two organisms as well as between an organism and its environment. So we're going to be talking about how organisms relate to each other, but also how they relate to the environments that they live in. So in order to do that, we need to know what it, it means to be an organism. If you remember, we've talked about an organism is just a living thing. So what does it mean to be alive? So in class, we're going to pause and we're going to do an activity about this. But for the sake of the video, we're just going to keep pressing through. So characteristics of life. Now, different biologists kind of organize these in different ways. Some say they're six, some say they're seven. Um, but in general, these are kind of the characteristics or the qualities that biologists have come together and said, this is what it means to be a living thing. So first, you have to be composed of one or more cells. So if you are an organism that is just one cell, you are unicellular, like a bacteria or a protus. If you are made of trillions of cells like us, you're like animals and plants and things like that, then you are considered multicellular. But if you remember from our cells unit, a cell is the most basic unit of life. So all living things are made of cells. That's really important. Second, and this kind of goes with that, is that to be a living thing, you have to have DNA or RNA as your genetic material. And if you remember, when we learned about cells, there's four things that all cells have in common, um, ribosomes, cytoplasm, a cell membrane, and then they all have genetic material. So if you're made of cells, you're going to have genetic material. So that's why I said those kind of go together. But this is really important. You have to have DNA or RNA. We have both, but that's not the case for bacteria. So that is really essential. The instructions for making you who you are are in those nucleic acids. Another characteristic of life is you have to be able, be capable of growth, meaning you have to be able to develop and become larger. And that could mean that, you know, your cells are dividing and you're getting more cells if you're multicellular or if you're a unicellular organism, just that one cell is getting bigger. But that is an important component of being alive. You also have to be capable of reproduction, which just means producing offspring. And that reproduction can be sexual, which means it takes two parents and together they produce genetically unique offspring. Or it could be an asexual process where one parent produces genetically identical offspring, such as how bacteria do binary fission. So the process doesn't matter as long as you're able to create offspring. You also have to demonstrate an ability to respond to outside stimuli in an environment. So stimuli is just plural for a stimulus, which is just a change in an organism's environment. And then the response is going to be how the organism reacts to a change in its environment. And this is something that we see in non-living organisms, or excuse me, once living organisms. They can, do not have the ability to respond to outside stimuli, thus they are considered once living as opposed to living. So for example, you know, in humans, if I, if a stimulus is a mosquito bites my hand, the response to my body is I'm going to have a reaction. Like I'm going to get a flared up little bite mark on my body. Um, a stimulus can be a change in temperature. If it gets really hot outside, my body is naturally going to start sweating in a response to cool down my body temperature. So it's another way people rephrase this is just your, your, the organisms, living things, they maintain homeostasis, and they do that by responding to outside stimuli. Um, and that's not exclusive to just animals. You know, plants do it too. All living things do it. For example, sunflowers tend to grow facing east towards the sunrise. So the stimulus is the sun rising, and the response is how the direction with which they face and their growth. So you have to be able to respond to stimuli. Now, another one is, as a population, you have to be able to adapt to the environment and evolve. So remember, organisms do not evolve, populations do, because evolution is at a from a genetic basis, and I can't change my genes. However, 
as populations of living things change over time, individuals that naturally have better traits, inherently have been better traits, those are adaptations, they're going to live longer and reproduce more. So we should see those traits become more common over time. So we should see the gene pool of the population changing over time. So that's really important. Again, also along the lines of um, maintaining homeostasis is having a metabolism. And, and, and in some way, you have to be able to consume energy and then produce waste from that as well. A metabolism, if you remember from unit three, is just all of the chemical reactions of each cell in an organism that are providing energy for its life's processes and also just creating key molecules for those life's processes. So this is kind of how I'm summarizing the characteristics of life. And I have a little song that I always teach my students, and it's silly, but it really helps them to remember the different characteristics. And it's sung to the tune of Row, Row, Row Your Boat. And I am no art song artist at all or musician in any way, but it basically just goes like this. Cells, cells, cells respond, grow, and reproduce. Use energy, have DNA, adaptive living dudes. So it's so silly, but this is how they remember. You're made of cells. You respond to stimuli. You're able to both grow and reproduce. You use energy, which means have a metabolism. You have DNA or RNA, genetic material. And then there's your have... As a population, you have you can adapt and evolve to environments. So this um, has been helpful for my students. I hope it's helpful for you. So now that we know what it means to be an organism, to be a living thing, let's talk about how we organize let, like life on an ecological standpoint. So I showed you this picture at the beginning of our school year when we were talking about the chemistry of life and water properties. And we talked about how you know, at the beginning of the year, we really spent a lot of time here in cell organelles, in our macromolecules, in cells, looking at genetics, that kind of thing. I told you tissues, organs, organ systems, were, those are really reserved for more like an anatomy class, so we're not going to get into those here. But now we're going to spend the rest of the year really here, looking at how organisms are organized into populations, and those are organized into communities and ecosystems and biomes. And then if you were to go on and take environmental science, you would look at the biosphere and all, all those different spheres, um, the atmosphere, all those different things in much more detail. But this is kind of where we're going to focus now when we're looking at ecology. Because again, ecology is the study of relationships between living things and their environment. So this is really where we're going to be focused. So it's kind of nice because we've kind of been in the micro level of biology. Now we're going to be more macro. So let's talk through each of those Terms. So notice I'm kind of zooming in here. This is what we're going to be focusing on. So again, an organism is just one living thing. It's an individual member of a species or a population. So for example, one deer. That is an example of one organism. Now, a population is a group of organisms. So multiple organisms of the same species living together in the same place. So it could be all of the deer that live in a particular field would be a population of deer. A community is multiple populations of different species living together. So let's say we're talking about that same field again. It would be all the deer, birds, plants, insects, squirrels, bacteria, etc. that inhabit that field. That would be a community. When I'm referring to an ecosystem, I'm referring to all of those things in the community, all the living things, but also all of the non-living factors. And non-living means abiotic, which we'll define a little bit later. So all of the non-living things as well. So all of the deer, birds, plants, insects, squirrels, bacteria, etc. But also looking at what does the temperature look like? What are the seasons look like? What does the precipitation level look like? The humidity um, all of those non-living factors as well that define a given area. That would be the ecosystem. Now, we see similar ecosystems on different parts of the world, and so those are be referred to as biomes. Biome is multiple ecosystems that share similar characteristics, but they're in different parts of the planet. So, for example, grassland. There are grassland ecosystems with really similar temperatures and precipitation levels and organisms that live there all over the world. Same with tundra. There's not just one tundra on earth. There are lots of different areas that would be qualified as tundras. So those are different biomes. Um, and we will do an activity with biomes in class that I think is really fun that you'll enjoy. And then last but not least is our biosphere. 
This is the zone of life on Earth. It's encompassing, encompassing all of Earth's ecosystems is our biosphere. And a key term that I feel like I'd be remiss not to mention is biodiversity. So when we're looking at the biosphere, we're looking at the variety of organisms that are considered at all levels. So we're looking at the variety in populations, like within groups of organisms of the same species living together, there's a ton of variation, but then also at an ecosystem level, all these different living things that are there. And over time, biodiversity has increased and we have millions of identified species, but there's also still millions that we believe we haven't even identified yet, which is crazy. So when we're looking at how diverse all of these living things are, how the heck do we organize them and categorize them? Well, we mentioned this in our evolution unit, but it's something called taxonomy. So we're gonna define it again because it's coming up in this unit as well. It's the field or the branch of biology that studies the classification of organisms. We're organizing organisms based on similar characteristics that they have. And if you remember, all life is organized into domains and kingdoms, phyla, classes, orders, families, genuses, and species. So every single living thing can be classified on all of these different levels. And remember, if we're going to refer to a organism, we're typically going to just use its two most specific names, its genus and its species, and that is binomial nomenclature. It's the two-name naming system that Carlos Linnaeus came up with to name organisms based on their two most specific classification levels. So for instance, a dog. Dogs are eukaryotes, so they're in the domain eukarya. They're animals, so they're in the kingdom animalia. They have spinal cords like we do, so we are all in the same phylum, which is chordata. They're mammals like us, so we're in the same class, which is mammalia. Their order is carnivora. Their family is canidae. Their genus is canis. And then their species can vary, but um, this example is lupus familiaris. So this is an example of how we go from broad to much more specific when we're classifying organisms. Now, remember the difference between taxonomy and phylogeny, even though both are using a lot of the same data and evidence and characteristics to classify, phylogeny is specifically looking at the evolutionary history of organisms and taxonomy is not doing that. Even though they can inform each other, they are different fields. Last but not least, I wanna introduce two different types of um, diagrams that can be used to help us um, classify organisms and organize them. One would be cladograms. These are diagrams that show the relatedness of organisms. So you might be looking at this and say, this looks exactly like a phylogenetic tree. You're not wrong, but they are different. The difference is just a cladogram is not showing ancestral relationships like a phylogenetic tree does. We're just showing relatedness, but we're not necessarily showing whose ancestors are whose. But we can look at this and say, okay, if I was gonna, if I was just looking at these five different organisms, so we've got a worm, a spider, a fly, a dragonfly, and a butterfly, we may say, okay, everything from here up has legs, which we can see. Everything from here up has wings. Everything from here up specifically has four wings. And then we have the ending two organisms. So we're just organizing based on characteristics, not evolutionary history. Another tool is a dichotomous key, and I love these. You may remember these from seventh grade life science. They're really fun. Um, it's just a tool used for identifying organisms based on their characteristics. So you take an organism and then you run it through one of these charts. So for instance, let's say we're looking at um, this fly. We would start at number one and say, okay, does the fly have legs or no legs? Okay, it has legs. We can see those. So then we go to step two. Step two says, does it have wings or no wings? Well, it does have wings, so we go to step three. Step three says, is that four wings or two wings? And all I can see are two. So because it has two wings, that means this must be a fly. So we can use this to help categorize organisms, and we are going to practice doing that now in our packets by categorizing some alien monsters. So I hope that will be helpful, and I hope this is a helpful introduction to ecology for you.